Hello, everybody. In this video lecture, we will cover anatomy of the central nervous system. So this is the PowerPoint that I will use. Let's go ahead and begin. So central nervous system, or CNS, consists of the brain and spinal cord. Spinal cord, location. It begins at the foramen magnum and ends at conus medullaris at L1 vertebra. So if you can, you see here that spinal cord uh, doesn't go all the way down the vertebral column, right? Because we still have even five lumbar vertebrae and then we have sacrum and coccyx um, when the spinal cord ends at level of L1. Function provides two-way communication to and from the brain and contains spinal reflex centers. So spinal cord is divided into 31 segments and there is a, spinal, a pair of spinal nerves that arise from each segment. Um, and um, you can see on this picture that um, spinal nerves that arise from cervical segment, mostly innervate neck and upper extremity from thoracic, they innervate um, the torso, then from lumbar, spinal nerve that um, arise from lumbar region, innervate the uh, low limbs and from sacral and coccyx. We have innervation of the um, groin over here, right, a little, uh, some part of the uh, legs as well. So spinal cord protection, uh, it's protected by bone, meninges, and cerebrospinal fluid, or CSF. So um, if, if you look over here, we can see the spinal cord, it's located inside the uh, vertebral uh, foramen, right? Um, and uh, this is the part of the vertebra that protects spinal cords, and we have meninges. This one and this would be dura matter. Um, this space called epidural space, and this is where you have a lot of cushioning, um, adipose tissue, and also network of veins. Um, then um, this part over here is called arachnoid, and below arachnoid matter, there is a subarachnoid space, and this is where cerebrospinal fluid circulates and then uh, pia matter that's surrounding brain tissue. Um, so there is a denticular ligament that is extension of pia matter that secure core to dura matter. So here, like a little ligaments over here, um, will um, secure the spinal cord uh, to the dura. And phylum terminale, is a fibrous extension from conus medullaris that anchors the spinal cord to the coccyx. And it's shown here kind of in, in this green color. So this is a phylum terminale. Um, spinal nerves, uh, we have 31 pairs. Uh, spinal cord is divided into 31 segments and each segment give ri gives rise to one pair of spinal nerves. We also have cervical and lumbar enlargement and nerves that um, arise from this enlargement, they serve upper and lower limbs. And coda iguina is a collection of nerve roots at the inferior end of the vertebral uh, canal. Um, so over here on this picture, you can see that's the spinal cord, right? And this is the conus medullaris. Uh, this is the end of the spinal cord. But then we have more of the spinal nerves that first go down and then exit through the intervertebral uh, foramina. And they form this structure uh, that look like a horse tail and it's called coda iguina. Um, so two groups divide cord into right and left halves. So this one and this. So we have ventral 
median fissure or anterior median fissure and dorsal median sulcus. Uh, gray commissure connects uh, these gray masses and encloses central canal. So this area, gray area here, is called gray commissure. Um, so inside there is a central canal, then we have gray matter and white matter, and gray matter, uh, it, it has uh, horns. So here's the ventral gray horn, this is dorsal gray horn, and in a, um, some region, uh, we have a ventral uh, gray horn. Uh, and then this is white matter over here. Now, each segment gives rise to a spinal nerve. So this area is a spinal nerve. And spinal nerve has two roots, um, ventral root and dorsal root. In a dorsal root, there is a dorsal root a ganglia right here. Um, right, so, um, so gray matter, dorsal horn, um, dorsal horn, ventral horn, um, roots, dorsal root over here, ventral root, and dorsal root ganglia. And over here also you can see uh, meninges, right? This is dura matter, then arachnoid matter, and pia matter. It uh, covers the tissue, nervous tissue here. So gray matter, dorsal horns, um, in the dorsal horns, uh, interneurons that receive um, somatic and visceral sensory input, ventral horns, somatic motor neurons whose axon exits a cord via ventral roots, and lateral horns, um, area where we would find sympathetic neurons, so those autonomic nervous system, and lateral horns only found in thoracic and lumbar regions. Uh, dorsal root ganglia contains cell body of sensory neurons. <clears throat> so what all this stuff means, look, here's the um, spinal nerve, right? So spinal nerve, inside the spinal nerve, you have lots, lots of uh, axons, right? I don't know really how many axons, but it's a huge number of axons. Uh, however, only four types. Uh, we have sensory, two type of sensory axons of a sensory neurons, right? So sensory fibers and two types of motor fibers. Uh, somatic sensory, visceral sensory, and somatic motor and visceral motor fiber, right? So spinal nerve is two-way street. So sensory information moves from periphery to the central nervous system. And motor information moves from central nervous system to the periphery. So spinal nerve is two-way street. It has both sensory neurons and motor neurons. But we get to this point where we have roots. Roots now one-way street. So in a dorsal root, we only have sensory neurons. In a ventral root, we only have motor neurons. Um, and <clears throat> sensory neurons, remember sensory neurons, they are unipolar. Um, so we have cell bodies here and one process, and then it's divided into two parts. Now this collection of cell bodies of sensory neurons are located in the ganglion. So dorsal root ganglion, this is where you would find cell body of the sensory neurons, both somatic and visceral. Um, now, <clears throat> sensory information moves towards the spinal cord, then it synapses with interneurons that located into um, dorsal horn. Um, here, shown in green, this is all our, uh, oh, th this is just visceral. Oh, but you, you do have interneurons over here that synapses with a motor neuron. So cell body of motor neurons are located into ventral horn. So in dorsal horn, we have sensory, uh, right? Uh, sensory information is received. So sensory uh, neurons, um, cell body of motor neurons located in the ventral horn. And in the lateral, uh, we have um, also motor neurons, but visceral motor neurons. Okay. 
So here's how your sensory information moves towards your central nervous system. And then it can uh, move to the white matter and go up to the brain. And um, this uh, signals from brain move down through white matter, right? And then through the ventral uh, root to the spinal nerve and uh, to your effector organs. So white matter consists of ascending, ascending goes up, sensory, and descending goes up, motor, tract. And there is three white columns or funiculi on each side. There is uh, dorsal, lateral, and ventral um, columns or um, funiculi. Right, so over here, it's shown here in the green color. Right, so this will be anterior uh, funiculi. So over here would be lateral, and here would be uh, dorsal. Okay, <laughs> now uh, we're moving to the anatomy of the brain. Uh, the main organ of the human uh, central nervous system is brain, and adult brain consists of uh, these four regions, cerebral hemispheres, right and left, diencephalon, uh, shown here in the purple color, brain stem, shown here in green, and cerebellum. This part is cerebellum. Um, so brain stem itself is made from three parts, medulla oblongata, pons, and midbrain. So together they make a brain stem. Um, so the um, brain, brain is also protected by meninges, the same as spinal cord. It has dura matter, arachnoid, and pia matter. Inside brain, you would also find a cavities, and they are interconnected cavities. They call ventricles of the brain. They connect it to one another and to the central canal of the spinal cord. So here, uh, shown in blue, uh, we have ventricles. They all have connection, and then they continue with the central canal of the spinal cord. They line by ependymal cells. So we have, so here on this um, diagram, you can see um, just the ventricular system that is taking out of the brain and it is color coded. So this C shape um, blue ventricles are lateral ventricles. So we have two lateral ventricles. Now this was shown here in yellow color, that's a third ventricle and it's located in the diencephalon and ventricle, um, well, lateral ventricles located in the cerebral hemispheres. And the fourth ventricle, uh, this purple one, located in the uh, hindbrain, uh, it dorsal to the pons, so it's, it's behind pons, and developed from the lumen of the neural tube. Um, and then um, you see this red part, this is called cerebral aqueduct. Cerebral aqueduct connect third ventricle and fourth ventricle. And what's shown here in green, um, this is central canal of the spinal cord. So cerebrospinal fluid uh, is clear, colorless, body fluid found in the brain and spine. Um, it gives a brain the a buoyancy. Um, so the actual mass of the human brain, uh, it feels like very small. It's almost one and a half kilogram, but it uh, feels like 25 grams because it's surrounding by fluid. It also gives protection, shock absorption, and circulation, delivers nutrients and remove waste. So those are function of uh, cerebrospinal fluid or CSF. Blood-brain barrier occurs along all capillaries and consists of tight junction around the capillaries that do not exist in normal circulation. Um, uh, when we cover histology of nervous tissue, we talk about glial cells, astrocytes, and astrocytes, they have these feet that surround capillaries in the brain, and they form this uh, protective layer that doesn't allow many substances to move from blood to the brain, like blood-borne pathogens. Uh, different microorganisms, viruses. So we want to protect our brain. Uh, it's only found in the brain, blood-brain barrier, 
Like this is normal capillaries, general capillaries, and this is capillaries in the brain. And this barrier uh, restricts the diffusion of microscopic object, for example, bacteria, and large or hydrophilic molecules into the CSF. Now, uh, we're going to start with brain stem, and then we will move to the cerebrum. So brain stem, evolutionary, the oldest part of our brain, controls primary instinct and automated action of the body, such as fight or flight response and heart rate. So here's the most primitive part of the brain. It has three regions, uh, midbrain, starting from the superior part, midbrain, pons, and medulla oblongata. So medulla oblongata, so this area over here, is a cone-shaped um, neuronal mass responsible for multiple autonomic, that means involuntary, functions, ranging from vomiting to sneezing. Medulla contains cardiac, respiratory, vomiting, and vasomotor centers, and therefore deals with the autonomic functions, such as breathing, heart rate, and blood pressure. Right, because it has cardiac center, it has respiratory center, it has vomiting center, it's control our breathing, heart rate, and blood pressure. So you can imagine that any damage to medulla uh, will affect these functions that are essential uh, for life, right? Very, very dangerous situation when brain stem is damaged. Bones located on the top of a medulla, um, its area of the brain stem directly above the medulla. Function is to connect upper and lower part of the brain. Without the pons, the brain wouldn't be able to function because messages from periphery would not be transmitted uh, to the brain. Um, also in the pons, we have um, uh, some uh, centers that's responsible for sleeping and dreaming. Uh, midbrain or mesencephalon associated with vision, hearing, motor control, sleep, wake, arousal, and temperature regulation. And when we're talking about vision and hearing, this is, you, you cannot really understand what you see or understand what you hear with your midbrain. Everything that requires your um, understanding, right? Everything that reaches your consciousness happen in a cerebral cortex. So here in midbrain, vision and hearing, those are reflex center. For example, if you if you know if you're just sitting and not thinking about you know anything, and then the light flashes, you in instantly will move your eyes and your head towards this light source, right? That's that midbrain responsible for that movement. Or if you're sitting watching TV and somebody drop a frying pan. So this noise, you know, uh, you hear this noise before you even recognize what happened, you're gonna move your head towards this noise, right? That's a reflex. So that's what midbrain uh, is responsible for this vision and hearing reflexes. And of course, for your sleep, awake, arousal. Uh, midbrain is made by three main structures, cerebral peduncles. Um, peduncle means food or base. Corpora quadragemina, corpora means body, and quadragemina means four, four, you know, like structure, a heel like structure, and cerebral aqueduct. Cerebral aqueduct is a canal dividing the two structure, cerebral peduncle and corpora quadragemina. And cerebral aqueduct, it's what connect third ventricle and fourth ventricle. So I'll go back for a second. Uh, I'll show you um, this red part over here. This is cerebral aqueduct. Okay, so let's go back. Um, so this is anterior view, um, and you can see, um, so this area is a midbrain. And um, here's cerebral peduncles. So cerebral peduncles are seen if you're looking um, on anterior view, right? So that's cerebral peduncle. Um, These two structures are called a mammillary body and they involve in the memories. Um, this structure is infundibulum and what attaches to infundibulum will be pituitary gland. 
right? Also, this structure uh, is, um, this is optic chiasma, and those are optic drafts. Now, all this yellow part that you see over here, those are cranial nerves that uh, we will discuss uh, also in a different lecture. Now, um, but if you look at uh, the posterior view, so that's posterior. Then you see this area here, one, two, three, four, right? This is carpora quadrigemina. And carpora quadrigemina is made from superior colliculi and inferior colliculi. So this structure and this structure, so this is carpora quadrigemina. And now this little gland over here, this is pineal gland. So pineal gland uh, secretes uh, melatonin um, that's responsible for your um, sleep and awake cycles and allow you to sleep at night. Um, so cerebral peduncle communicate with the cerebellum. This communication result in your sense of proprioception. Um, cranial nerves three and four originate in the cerebral peduncle and they innervate muscles and move your eyes, uh, right? And anchoring your vision and enabling you to rotate your eyes in their sockets rather than having to turn your head when you want to look at something, right? So um, again, we can go back and look at the cerebral peduncles, right? So here is the cerebral peduncle right here and over here. And this is cranial nerve number three, that is ocular motor nerve. Um, okay, so uh, we started with the brain, a stem, medulla, pons, midbrain. Now we in this area shown here in green, this is diencephalon. Diencephalon has three paired structure, thalamus, hypothalamus, and epithalamus and it's, it closes the third ventricle. So the, um, this is mid-sagittal cross of the brain. Um, so if you have another structure like this, right, you put it together, you will have your complete brain. And um, right in between, in this area, will be a third ventricle. So third ventricle is located between uh, two uh, thalami. This is the thalamus. So function of the thalamus, thalamus is get, um, gateway to the cerebral cortex. Thalamus sorts, edits, and relays information. So uh, all the sensory information, all these afferent impulses from all your body parts go through the thalamus. And then thalamus responsible to, um, for, uh, responsible for sending those uh, se um, sensory signals to appropriate part of your brain, a cerebral cortex. Uh, so if damage, all sensory information would not be processed and sensory confusion would result. So thalamus um, uh, receives and, um, and relays the information from um, um, you know, from different parts of your body, sensory information to specific part of the cerebral cortex. Um, there is only one sensory information that does not go through the thalamus uh, before it reaches your cortex, and this is olfaction, your smell. Your smell goes straight from your uh, uh, olfactory epithelium, from those uh, sensory neurons in your nose, it goes straight to your brain, and then it goes to the thalamus. Everything else, like your vision, it goes to thalamus first, then to your cerebral cortex. Uh, if you touch something, this information goes to your thalamus, then to your cerebral cortex. So hypothalamus, so thalamus would be um, this part, this round look like an egg, Right, and we have two of them. So that would be one thalamus, and it will be another thalamus. So two of them, two thalami. Now this is hypothalamus. Uh, hypothalamus forms the inferior lateral walls of the third ventricle, and it contains many nuclei. For example, mammillary body um, that are paired anterior nuclei and olfactory relay station. Um, also, from hypothalamus, you have this stalk. It's called infundibulum, and it connects to a pituitary gland, right? So here's the uh, pituitary gland right there. 
so function of hypothalamus, um, regulation of body temperature, food intake, water balance, thirst, regulate sleep and sleep cycle, control uh, release of hormones by the pituitary gland, anterior pituitary, and produces posterior pituitary hormones. So hypothalamus, if we go back over here, so hypothalamus is a nervous tissue, but it connects your nervous system with endocrine system. Because this pituitary gland over here, this is your endocrine gland. It used to be called the master gland, I don't think they call it this way anymore, but hypothalamus is direct connection between nervous and endocrine system. And hypothalamus regulates your temperature. Hypothalamus regulates the release of hormones from pituitary gland. And even, to, even, <laughs> even more, hypothalamus makes its own endocrine hormones, right? uh, oxytocin and ADH. So it makes its own hormones and it's regulate hormones secreted from pituitary gland, anterior pituitary. Um, cerebellum, shaped like a butterfly, uh, lateral wings or lobes referred as hemispheres. Um, so we do have cerebral hemispheres and we have cerebellar hemispheres. And each hemisphere consists of lobes that are separated by deep, distinct fissures. Um, so cerebellum also has a cortex, and it has this white matter that has special name. It's called arbor vitae, or white uh, tree, right? Or tree of life, a ah, tree of life. Um, yeah, so this is the white uh, matter, arbor vitae, and uh, cortex of the cerebellum. Um, the surface of the cerebellum called cortex, it consists of gray matter and parallel ridges called uh, folia. Beneath the cortex are white matter tract called arbor vitae, and it's attached to the brain stem by three paired bundles of fibers called cerebellar peduncles. Uh, function of the cerebellum, it's important for being able to perform everyday voluntary tasks such as walking, riding, essential to being able to stay balanced and upright. Patients who have suffering from damaged cerebellums often struggle keeping their balance and maintaining proper muscle coordination. And now we're moving to cerebrum. Cerebrum is the bulk of the brain. The surface is composed of gray matter referred as a cerebral cortex. Right, so here, that's a cerebral cortex, gray matter. So we have cell bodies of neurons over here. And beneath the cortex is white matter. So cerebrum um, have um, these folds, right? So it's not flat. It has lots of ridges that goes up and, do and down, up and down, up and down, right? So those folds or ridges called gyri. Gyrus is singular, and sulci are furrows, which increase the surface area of your brain. Uh, the deep um, furrows are called fissures. So if you look here at a piece of the um, brain, cerebrum, you see those ridges, right? That's a gyrus or gyri, when we have plural, or sulcus or sulci um, for plural, right? So that's um, like uh, furrows and those are uh, ridges. Now, <clears throat> cerebral hemispheres. So this is gyri and sulci um, and uh, fissures. They actually separate cerebral hemisphere into several lobes. So we have um, this pink part. It's a frontal lobe. Then um, we have um, occipital lobe over here, parietal lobe, and temporal lobe. Oh my goodness, that's all wrong. I'm sorry, parietal here, occipital over there. Let me, let me see if I can, okay. Yeah, of course, occipital on the back. I'm like, what is that? Okay, that's parietal, that's occipital. I'm sorry for that. So 
I'm going to fix it very quickly. Okay. Yeah. Okay. So let's do it again. Frontal lobe in front, parietal lobes and occipital on the back, right where your occipital bone is. Pointer. Um, temporal bone over here. And if you kind of like move frontal away from the temporal, you will see one more lobe over here and it's called insula. Um, now what separate frontal lobe from parietal lobe is this sulcus. It's called central sulcus. Um, now we have two cerebral hemispheres. That's the left cerebral hemisphere. This is right cerebral hemisphere. What connects them together, uh, first we have a fissure, longitudinal fissure here. Um, but what connects them together is a bundle of uh, white matter called corpus callosum. So corpus callosum is white matter that connects left and right cerebral hemisphere. And this um, uh, groove in between called longitudinal fissure. And so over here, we have central sulcus that divide frontal and parietal. And in the middle, we would have longitudinal fissure that divides two hemispheres. And this is called transverse fissure that divides cerebrum from cerebellum. Um, okay, so here we can see the corpus callosum. So this is the corpus callosum. This part of white matter is called fornix. So that would be a lateral ventricle. Right? This part will be the thalamus. Here's hypothalamus. Um, now this part is midbrain. And in the posterior side, we have corpora quadrigemina, pons, medulla. This is the fourth ventricle. The third ventricle will be right here between two thalamites. Uh, <clears throat> this fissure over here is called parieta occipital fissure. Sometimes they call it sulcus as well. So, but this is parieta occipital sulcus of fissure. This is transverse fissure and longitudinal fissure separates two hemispheres. So here's central sulcus, lateral sulcus, parieta occipital sulcus. Yeah, but it's really huge. Look. That's really big. So in some uh, books, you will see parietal occipital fissure and transverse fissure. So central sulcus separate frontal from parietal. Lateral divide frontal and parietal from temporal. Parietal occipital separate parietal and occipital and transverse separate cerebrum from cerebellum. So we'll see, okay. Good, I have all this stuff. So now this is frontal lobe. So eyes would be right here. So frontal and parietal, we have central sulcus. Now parietal, frontal, and temporal, right? We have this lateral um, this sulcus over here, right? lateral sulcus, but here lateral fissure, because it's, it's really pretty big. Now here's a parietal occipital sulcus. And um, of course we don't have a transverse fissure, but I'm going to show you transverse fissure. It's right here. That separate cerebrum, right, from cerebellum. That transverse fissure. Right, this one. Uh, frontal lobe, shown here in green. Frontal and upper area of the cortex carries out higher mental processes, such as thinking, decision-making, planning, you use it to make decisions, such as what to eat or drink for breakfast in the morning, as well as thinking or studying for your test. And this is where your personality is located. This is where it's formed, and this is where you carry higher mental processes, um, necessary for being able to speak fluently and meaningfully. So this is what makes you, you frontal law. This is where you, uh, study for your exam. This is where you're planning. This is where you make your decision. This is where you understand what is wrong and what is right. Parietal lobes, now shown here in green. 
and remember, we have two lobes of, um, of H. So we have two frontal lobes because they are separated by this longitudinal fissure. So two parietal lobes, location upper and back part of the cortex processes sensory information that had to do with taste, temperature, and touch. So sensory information is received by parietal lobe. Humans wouldn't be able to feel sensation of touch if the parietal lobe was damaged. So if you get damage here, anybody touches you, you do not feel it. Temporal lobe, or two temporal lobes, bottom middle part of cortex right behind the temples. And a major function is um, it's responsible for processing auditory information from the ears or for your hearing. Uh, key to being able to comprehend or understand meaningful speech. In fact, without it, it would not be able, uh, somebody would not be able to understand someone talking to us. Occipital lobe, bottom and back part of the cortex responsible for processing visual information from the eyes. So visual information from your eyes move to the uh, thalamus first and from thalamus to the occipital lobe. If our occipital lobe was impaired or injured, we wouldn't be able to correctly process visual signal and we would have visual confusion. Now, um, homeostatic imbalances of the brain, concussion and contusion. Concussion is temporary alternation on function and contusion is permanent damage. And it's caused by some traumatic events or injuries to the brain. Uh, subdural or subarachnoid hemorrhage. Um, so if you look over here, we have a skull then we have this um, epidural space over here, right? And, um, and this is subdural space. So for example, if we have some uh, breakage in a blood vessel and blood enters the subdural space, then this will be subdural hemorrhage. If it moves down, in uh, arachnoid, because this uh, orange one is arachnoid and this is subarachnoid space, then it would be uh, subarachnoid hemorrhage. Um, and um, this is very dangerous because this blood can push your brain through the foramen, foramen magnum, um, so, and this will result in death. Cerebral edema is swelling of the brain associated with traumatic head injury. Um, another uh, homeostatic imbalances uh, we're gonna mention here is CVA or cerebrovascular accident or stroke. Uh, blood circulation is blocked and brain tissue dies and blockage of the cerebral artery by a blood clot can lead to the stroke. So what is a stroke? Well, stroke is uh, death of a brain tissue. Why would brain tissue die? Because it doesn't get oxygen. Why wouldn't it get oxygen? Because there is a blockage of the cerebral artery. So if cerebral artery is blocked, no oxygen reaches brain tissue, brain tissue dies. This is what CVA, cerebrovascular accident. Typically leads to hemiplegia. Hemiplegia means only one side of the body is affected. Uh, or sensory and speech deficits. There is also TIA. TIA is um, transient ischemic attack. This is temporary blockage of the brain tissue from blood supply, and it's reversible, um, right? So let's say you have a patient, and patient um, shows pretty much all the symptoms of the stroke, uh, but it's just temporary. It can go uh, away on its own. Then it's just a small ischemic attack. Ischemic means low oxygen supply, right? This CVA, it's complete blockage of blood supply. 
Uh, and of course, patients that has TIA, um, th this is a warning sign. It means um, arteries are not in a good shape, and this is usually a sign for a bigger stroke. So it's also you know, pretty dangerous, and it, it might not be dangerous that much on its own, but it just shows that blood vessels are not in a good condition, and it, it can, they can be clot that will cause a stroke. And there is a treatment, uh, TPA, tissue plasminogen activator, and this is a treatment for a stroke. What it does, it pretty much breaks this blood, uh, or breaks this clot, like a blood clot. Uh, and spinal cord trauma, it can be either sensory loss or motor loss. If you have a loss of motor function, it's called paralysis. Uh, Parasthesia is a sensory loss. Now there is two types of paralysis. There is flaccid paralysis and there is spastic paralysis. So flaccid paralysis is when impulses do not reach muscles. So, uh, and you know, nothing really reaches muscles. Muscles do not move. There is no voluntary movement. You cannot move it. And there is no any reflex. You know, sometimes our muscles can be moved without our consciousness, consciousness um, activation by reflexes. So when there is no any supply of the uh, nerve impulses to a muscle tissue, that muscle will, be, uh, will become flaccid. So that's a flaccid paralysis and it will cause muscle atrophy. So muscle will uh, slowly start dying. Uh, spastic paralysis, like this one, this is where there is a damage of upper motor neurons, the ones that go from your cerebral cortex to your muscles. But muscles can still be stimulated and activated by reflexes. So spinal reflexes are intact, but no voluntary control of the muscle. And this causes muscles to be very often, you know, stimulated uh, either for a prolonged amount of time or of course you cannot control this contraction of the muscle it just through the spinal reflexes okay let me see if we how far we yet uh, yes so one last slide so spinal cord trauma can include transsection transsection is a cross section of a spinal cord and it can result in paraplegia or quadriplegia. Well, paraplegia, para means two, and this is only when two limbs are affected. So like here, only legs are affected. Or depends if you go up and the damage is in a higher part of the spinal cord. Uh, we can lose the, um, first of all, Transaction leads to um, loss of both movement and sensation. So if you have cross-section and the patient have paraplegia, this would be a patient or this one. So there is no movement and no sensation from this area of your body. Depends where injury is, right? If it's in the lumbar region and sacral region, or then it, it will only affect uh, legs. If you move to the thoracic region, it will also affect the uh, torso. But if it's uh, between T1 and L1 in a cervical region, then it will be, um, oh, I'm sorry, uh, this is, uh, so paraplegia T1, L1. So T is thoracic. From T1 till L1 result in only two extremities that lose their movement and sensation, paraplegia. When it's in a cervical region, it will result in quadriplegia, and quadra means four. So all four limbs are affected, right? So uh, let's say this patient has injury at a level of C4 or C6, right, cervical region, uh, and uh, this patient has quadriplegia. 
Um, okay, so this is the last slide. Um, I want to remind you that in this video lecture, we covered anatomy of the central nervous system. Thank you for watching, and I hope it was helpful.